What's up everyone, it's Rajan on the mic. In this video we are going to try to understand the first trance tracks of the late 80s. There are only a handful of such tracks and they can be considered as trance only retrospectively. But they give the foundation of someone that will bloom in full in the 90s. Let's go! <laughs> In English, there is a great phrase to describe the low end in dance music – fat bass. Well, as for me, I can't remember such phrase to describe the mids, except for maybe squelchy acid lines. Even if it sounds weird for someone out of subject, squelchy acid lines is the best way to describe something that happened to the electronic dance music scene after 1987, when acid house emerged. The story goes like this. In 1984, Roland released their bass machine TB303. However, TB303 didn't get any attention and all the devices were gathering dust in the warehouse. The concept behind TB303 was to provide musicians with an electronic bass player to rehearse and perform with. But the innovative machine was not popular. The TB303 just didn't sound good. By surprise, some fellows from Chicago found one cheap device on a flea market and recorded a track just for fun. But instead of recording the bass properly, they just cranked the knobs all out. That's the way that signature squelchy acid sound was discovered. A sound that the TB303 simply was not designed for. So, future acid tracks, Chicago 1987. Can you hear the squelchy synth? That's a resonance knob cranked all out, going around all the frequency range throughout the loop. Despite the minimalism of the arrangement, this trick gives an impression of unpredictability, like an out-of-control synth. What we hear can be described as the sound of the machines rose from the ashes of the nuclear fire. That unpredictable and hypnotic feel is an essential part of psychedelic music, and this feel can be created in many ways. In acid tracks, the squelcher lead from TB303 and this emphasized resonance modulation create the feel of unpredictability, while the four on the floor beat, with the help of the aforementioned looped acid lead, creates that hypnotic atmosphere. But it is not the first time when psychedelic scenes merge with four on the floor kick lines. Trans music has much more ancient ancestors. Listen to E2 E4, a hypnotic album by Manuel Goching, a leader of Ashra Temple, released on 1984. <laughs> Acid Tracks by Future gave birth to the genre of Acid House. It is still not trans music yet, nevertheless, that distinctive approach to the timbre, the sound and the rhythm, symbiosis of unpredictability and hypnotism will become later a hallmark for many genres of electronic dance music and first and foremost for trance. We can interpret the word acid in track title in many ways. Some say that acid refers to LSD. Others say that it is a reference to the psychedelic rock or the sound of the MOOC scene from the 1974 track Fedra by Tangerine Dream. Anyway, it is not about etymology. Moreover, for this case, all the variants are legit, and each of them can tell an approximate range of symbols which one can find in the emerging rave culture. Despite the minimalism, acid tracks became very popular on the dance floor and gave rise to countless successors. Unlike America, in 1988, acid house genre hit English charts and the band KLF decided to catch the wave of hype of this sound. KLF are famous for writing funny, if not mocking songs and I haven't found any serious track of them in their early period. The band aimed primarily at getting into hit parades. For every song they released, they made several mixes, with one of them recorded specially for Acid House scene. Remix of the song What Time Is Love is on the B side of the plate. With 
such arrangement, what is love became much darker and psychedelic than all of the Acid House tracks that were released in England at that time. Acid House was much brighter, whimsical, and even frivolous. For example, like this. this is acid. KLF offered a serious alternative to this sound, and we can even call What Time Is Love a symbolic missing link between space rock and somewhat that would become trance later. As for instrumental part, What Time Is Love consists of a synth loop with a bit of oriental music elements. The song is in Phrygian mode, which is the most popular scale in Goa trance, so I think we can refer to it as a direct predecessor. By the way, a monotonous synth line is almost identical to another alternative club hit of 1984, Our Darkness by Anne Clark. Our Darkness was released four years before, and we can consider it as one more ancestor of trance music. Actually, no wonder that those two riffs match. That is the most simple one bar riff that we can play with three fingers, and you can hear it on many tracks from metal to pop. For example, we can hear it in the Jesus Christ Superstar by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Just listen to the guitar on the overture Heaven on Their Minds. But let's get back to KLF. Despite the pure trans slogan on the cover of the vinyl, there is no reason to argue that this is the manifestation of the new genre. First of all, the word trans can often be found in names of many different singles and albums released long before the genre appeared. Second, all the tracks of KLF that we can call trance are just a byproduct of the band's main activities. Just look at their music videos. For instance, in 1991, KLF recorded What Time Is Love with Glenn Hughes, ex vocalist of Deep Purple. All the musical elements that then would become an essential part of trance subculture, such as straight beat, hypnotic rhythm, unpredictability, futuristic melodies, ethnic elements, mystical or religious topics like transcendence or pagan aesthetics, have been with us in music way before 1988. However, only in the late 80s, early 90s, musicians began to merge all of these elements together, experimenting with sound. Until this time, no one ever tried to use these elements together consciously and intelligently. Simply put, the trend was not yet formed and without trend, no genre can exist. Genre cannot be formed by a single musician, even by a genius. For instance, the emergence of hard rock occurred not only because of, say, Black Sabbath. The gradual hardening of sound was an evolutional process that became apparent because of bands like Trogs with their hit You Really Got Me, The Who, and Beatles with Helter Skelter, Heavy Blues of Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Iron Butterfly, Blue Cheer, Uri Heap, and so on. In the same manner, no matter that Blaise Pascal was first to raise question of existential philosophy in 17th century, until Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Sartre, Karl Jaspers, Lev Shostov, and Nikolai Berdyaev, there was no existential philosophy tradition at all. Same happened in pictorial art. We cannot consider Archimboldi a surrealist painter. He lived in 16th century, and it does not matter that Dali and other 20th century painters were working in this similar manner. Up until 20th century, surrealist art movements did not exist. There was no such trend in the times of Archimboldi. And the same can be told about the trans genre. We can assume that all the tracks I mentioned in this video are just a random use of elements that trans includes. We can talk about genre only after we encounter regularity, a consistent and conscious use of patterns. Therefore, all the tracks I mentioned in the video we can attribute to trans only retrospectively. 
The next track that we can attribute to trance is from Belgium. In the 1980s, Belgium became famous for its underground new beat scene, a slow, eerie and sexual mixture of industrial with dark wave, electronic body music and acid. In 1988, the band Neon released the track No Limit with the aforementioned one-bar Phrygian riff. The music on the track evolves slowly, instruments appear in a serial manner and then the kick enters. From the moment the track becomes more straight, the groove becomes more even and the song goes in such repetitive manner until the end. No Limit is the only transit track of the band. Other tracks of Neon are much more dance oriented with uh, frank sex appeals like Baby Wants to Ride. At the same time, in one of their other tracks, Neon described themselves as an acid band with a singer uttering to all the creators of acid music. Yeah, acid was a popular word 30 years ago. Let's move on. Stacker Humanoid by Humanoid, 1988, is the first Acid House track that managed to get into the mainstream. Very influential and powerful track, probably one of the heaviest tracks of its time. Humanoid was an unknown project and in some random way they got into the weekly radio rotation. What is much more inconceivable, it got into the top of the pops because at that time BBC banned everything that could be attributed to Acid House. Track got into the top 10 and Brian Dugans, who wrote Stucker Humanoid, in a few years will create a project, The Future Sounds of London. Acid House was a scandalous phenomenon at that time. Not as scandalous as punk was 10 years before, but nevertheless. It was closely related to drugs, illegal parties and underground. Top of the Pops producers tried to refine the humanoid's performance by adding two energetic dancers that did not belong to the project. In addition, producers insisted the track contains vocals, so that someone has to sing. In fact, it was not a vocal line, it was just a sample from the arcade game named Berserk. As Brian Dugans would describe this performance later, it's a fucking computer, man. Anyway, these busters forced me to act like I'm a singer. But what would he expect? It's the top of the pops. And this dancing basis is also on stage because the producers wanted it to be like this. This guy was Brian's only friend in London, in whose squad Brian stayed at these times. He didn't know how to play bass. And of course, the bass wasn't plugged in. And that is the difference between underground and mainstream scenes. A guy performs on the most popular music TV show in Britain and sleeps in the squad without even electricity. The public wanted some new kind of music and was ready for it. But mainstream could not offer an alternative, so they had to search in the underground. And now how the track works. The track starts with a simple drum machine loop. Four bars later the bass kicks in. Then four more bars later the Latin percussion plays. And then throughout a minute or so, each four or eight bars some elements come in and fade out. And this approach became a fundamental principle of arrangement for the most electronic tracks with a four on the floor beat. Dynamic changes happen due to adding or removing or replacing the elements. Some top end lines come in, then they're replaced by Latin percussion, then percussion fades out and synth lead kicks in, etc. etc. Then when time for a break comes, all the elements fade out, leaving only the kick or a thick drone sound. You will never find a climax in such music. Later, it will become a distinctive feature of trance, or also techno, house, lots of other genres of electronic music. If you take rock music, for example, everything would be different.
Anyway, the track changes drastically after a minute. A brutal robotic voice shouts, Oh my night! After which a usual Roland bass loop kicks in. The sound of resonant snob, the distinctive top and squelchy sound interchanges with percussive loops. And while KLF make the bass and the lead scene sound as separate instruments, in Stucker Humanoid it acts as a lead and as a bass at the same time. That acid bass line draws all the attention. The next track is Age of Chance, Time's Up, 1989. We're looking for the remixed version of the track on the B side of the plate. The track has a soft kick, monotonous and hypnotic bass and two new and very important elements that later would become popular in trance. Listen to the choppy vocals, a technique that is very popular in modern trance. The track has a percussive line echoing along the stereo pan, a sample from Pink Floyd's The Great Geek in the Sky and a mystic female whisper. It is a way too warm and soft track for acid house or techno. The track is also arranged upon the described earlier additive principle. Instruments sporadically appear, line up in a tiny atmospheric stream and come back to kick and bass, and then repeat. Actually, the band Age of Chance has started with completely different music. If you want to see the agony of post-punk scene, then Age of Chance is the best example. In 1987 they released a peppy album at the intersection of rock, dance and hip-hop, with bright and lively disco and rave aesthetics with edgy slogans like Stay young, say yeah, call each other baby. After two years they have changed the vocalist by the demand of the record company that hope to make the band a hit in the charts. But the band rolled down to the pale commercial synth pop and died. Anyway, between those two albums the band released several remixes of their own track and two of them are really designed in the style of early trance. Some people describe them as first trance records even though they were byproducts of the B-side. Finally we come to the 1989, the KLF again with another remix to their own track Kylie set to Jason. On the first side of the plate you can find the sugary and wretched synth pop, which mock the popular dance stars Kyle Minogue and Jason Donovan. The story says uh, the KLF were almost bankrupt and tried to hit the charts in any possible way. But on the B side of the plate we have something very very interesting. Track starts with a straight hi-hat pattern and a monotonous as it seemed line with a beat of echo. It is a two-bar pattern with the first bar as a question and second as the answer. All of it is layered by one more simple three-note synth line on the top, also delayed. When the kick and the very deep soft bass kicks in, we're already near something that should be called trance. Towards the end of the track a female voice starts to whine, making the track a rare example of making trance music sound sexy. The track does not have any distinctive structure, elements replace each other pretty randomly, they layer each other to fade out in the end. Let's move on. Abfart. Uh, alone, it's me, 1989. Another Phrygian two-bar melody. Filters are running carefully with no crazy tricks. Each instrument is where it belongs, so that the instruments don't interrupt each other.
All of the tracks I have described here have a big space and at the same time we have a feeling of isolation. This happens because the drum machine is situated closer to the listener, but the synthesizers are heavily processed by delay and reverb. Echo gives a pulsating groove that creates the feel of sound reflecting from surface of the whole multiple times. That is an unfamiliar to human ear acoustical environment, or better to say, a natural. We can hear similar effects in a long and narrow space. Because of emptiness in the mid frequencies, we feel the depths. Nothing borders the lead instruments. They are freely flying in the space. Most tracks are in Phrygian mode. That is the most oriental of European scales, the most enigmatic and the most popular in Goa trance. Now you know where the roots are coming from. However, Simon Reynolds assumes that despite the oriental mood of the trance, this music remains exclusively European. All that pictures a bit eerie and a strange atmosphere. The listener feels being isolated and at the same time being in a huge space. On the aesthetical and maybe some conscious level, that conveys a feeling of disorientation. We have an impression of loneliness and at the same time the feel of harmony with the music. Rajan was near the mic. That's the time to hit subscribe and ring the bell to not miss something. I'm always ready for the lively discussion, so leave the comments below on any occasion. If I have missed something important or you know the track that belongs to the roots of trance in the following years, throw it in the comments. See you guys. Turn off that motherfucking radio. Yeah, I just wanted to call the second. Turn off that motherfucking radio. Yeah, I just wanted to call